Hello and welcome. The following presentation is information that I've put together kind of as a medical detective to figure out the um, issues and uh, problems in dealing with chronic Lyme disease and also offering some solutions. So I hope you enjoy this program and I will see you on the other side. All right, let's dive right in with tick-borne disease or Lyme disease as it's also known. So first of all, we want to go over some facts about Lyme disease, some symptoms and signs of Lyme disease, also some common co-infections that relate to Lyme disease. And then we're going to go over some clinical tests that you may or may not heard of and some that are effective or not. And then common treatments for Lyme, again, some that you may have heard of or may have not have. First of all, let's go into the history of Lyme. You know, Lyme actually started in the early 70s, and there's a lot of theories, even a lot of conspiracies on, you know, how Lyme first started, and, and it's hard to know which one is true. There's many unknowns with Lyme. Uh, actually, Lyme began in Connecticut. It was an area called Lyme, Connecticut, and there was a large amount of people there that just started getting odd symptoms. They started getting sick, swollen joints. They started getting signs of paralysis, skin rashes, headaches, uh, severe chronic fatigue, and they were getting all these health uh, changes. So then some researchers came in and said, hey, what's going on here? Um, and then they kind of described the symptoms of this new disease and they called it Lyme, but they really still didn't know the exact cause. Uh, so they just called it Lyme syndrome which is a collection of symptoms. Well, then in the early 80s, there was a researcher that was uh, re already researching Rocky Mountain Spotted Tick Fever. And he said, hey, you know, this sounds kind of similar. Let me go take a look. And he found that the disease was connected to these deer tick bacteria. And it was a bacteria called the spirochete. So, Hooray, you know, he figured out some information there. And in about 1982, the medical community said, hey, great job, Dr. Bordurfer. Um, and they honored him by giving the name of the bacteria uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, so they named it after him. Now, then, you know, around, um, well, actually, after the 80s, there was this pretty big increase. In fact, it increased, Lyme increased to the point that it actually became a national public health problem. And in 2012, the CDC finally said, hey, you know, this is in our top 10 notifiable diseases, meaning, hey, if a doctor sees this or sees somebody who has this, they need to report it to us, let us know, because we're seeing about 300,000 to 500,000 people per year developing Lyme disease. And, and these other tick-borne infections too. And then so, you know, basically these researchers are like, hey, this is pretty hard to diagnose. Um, it's kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. It's like, hey, if you can't figure out anything else, maybe see if it's Lyme. And initially too, it was thought that, hey, this is really just an East Coast issue, you know, especially Northeast Coast. Um, but then as time has gone by, we found out, hey, no, it's actually in the entire United States. The only place it hasn't been reported yet is in Hawaii, which is very interesting. So uh, another interesting side that I'll see with a lot of patients is actually they'll come and say, hey, Dr. Bakel, you know, my uh, my doctor told me or, or basically they went to the doctor and they said, I feel lousy. I got bit by a tick. I've got this rash. I'm starting to feel yucky. And uh, the doctor will say, hey, no, that's just an East Coast disease. This is something else. And, and I hate to say that, you know, these are uninformed, um, uh, possibly even uneducated about Lyme, uh, these doctors are. And so the thing is, is to um, get this information out there, not only to, to people who are suffering, but also to their doctors so they learn more about Lyme. So what does the CDC say about Lyme? Basically, it says, hey, yeah, it is caused by this Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria, and you get the infection through a black-legged tick, and uh, you can get these uh, symptoms like fever, headache, fatigue, uh, this rash called erythema migrans. And, uh, you know, if left untreated, yeah, maybe it could spread to your joints, your heart, your nervous system. That's more of what the CDC says. And then uh, as far as diagnoses, they're mainly diagnosing on symptoms, especially the rash. They kind of want you to have that rash. And then, um, you know, and then also for you to say, yeah, I did get bit by a tick. 
Uh, and then also then the laboratory testing that uh, is performed that's recommended by the CDC. And we'll talk more about that soon also. And then the treatment, of course, is antibiotic therapy. And then they also do believe that uh, there can be other co-infections that travel with Lyme, other bad guys. So uh, another association started and they basically said, hey, you know, the CDC really isn't on this very well. We're seeing a lot of people with these Lyme issues and the CDC's methods for diagnosing and dealing with things isn't a very good method. So us as doctors are going to figure out a better way. At least that's my interpretation of ILADS. So the cause um, that they say is, yeah, it is. It's a bite of a tick. Doesn't mean that it's always that black-legged deer tick. Then the clinical diagnoses, um, uh, basically they're saying, hey, yeah, it's this uh, spirochete-shaped um, bacteria called Borrelia, Borrelia burgdorferi, and this can cause a wide range of symptoms. Now, what they also note is that 50% of people with Lyme disease never even re be, recall getting a tick bite and 50% uh, never even recall getting any rash. So do you have to have the rash? Do you have to remember getting bit by a tick? No, not at all. Uh, this uh, happens frequently. And then the testing, they're saying, hey, you know, that testing that's recommended by the CDC, it's very unreliable. So we're going to talk about other testing here in a moment. And then as far as symptoms and treatment, they're saying, hey, you know, there's other ways to treat this, not only the Lyme, but the co-infections too. So I've really kind of come up with my own um, definition of what's going on in people with Lyme. And it, it includes more than Lyme. And I'm going to explain why later in this, but I call it MS-TIDS. And what does that mean? Multi-systemic toxin and infection syndrome or infectious disease syndrome. So I feel it's a, a group of, of things that are occurring in people with Lyme. It's not just, hey, I have Lyme and that's it and that's causing everything. There's usually other factors involved. I would say I've never seen a patient with Lyme that doesn't have something else affecting their system. So we'll talk more about that as we go and, and, why, and what that really means. All right. So Another thing too about Lyme, there are theories that Lyme isn't just carried by deer ticks, that it is carried by other ticks and potentially even a mosquitoes. And then uh, some people even said, hey, possibly even like a spider or something. We don't know completely because there's not enough research performed on these different what we call vectors. Uh, definitely, you know, ticks can be the biggest factor there. And then the biggest thing here too, misdiagnosis and mistreatment of Lyme is rampant. There's people out there suffering with this who are being diagnosed with all kinds of things, you know, Alzheimer's, MS, um, autoimmune issues, neuropathy, fibromyalgia, inflammatory arthritis. I mean, actually the list goes on and on because Lyme is the great mimicker and doctors don't tend to look for it. And the tests that they are in the standard of care recommended by the CDC are very unreliable. So even if the person did have it, the test will miss it anyway. And they and, and if you didn't get the rash, if you don't remember getting bit by a tick, then it, it doesn't even come across the radar. So like I said, Lyme is the great mimicker. It can actually create um, so many other problems. And, uh, you know, it can cause these symptoms, joint pain and swelling that migrates, uh, severe fatigue, brain fog, paresthesias. Paresthesias is like, you know, numbness and tingling, which can occur hands, feet, you know, actually in many places of the body. Headaches, skin rashes, especially skin rashes that kind of move around. This is just the common things that we hear about. Actually, there's a lot more that I'm going to get to. Now, this is a really interesting picture because this is where they actually looked at Lyme through a scanning electron microscope. Um, not many labs, zero doctors are using these in their clinics. But again, this is the way you can really see what Lyme is doing. It's actually attacking a human B cell. What's a B cell? That's your immune system. Lyme attacks your immune system and compromises it. And that just keeps the door open to not only more Lyme growth and co-infection growth, but other uh, infectious agents. It kind of opens the door to all kinds of bad guys and bad things because your immune system isn't functioning properly. So if you've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, 
chronic fatigue syndrome. If you've been diagnosed with CFIDS, and you know what that is if you're watching this, and, and many CFIDS patients will get tested for Lyme, but their tests usually show up negative. Again, a lot of it is the testing. Autoimmune diseases, SIRS, I mean, the list goes on and on here of different conditions that are diagnosed that actually have turned out to be Lyme. So what does chronic Lyme do? Like I was talking about, it actually lowers the immune system. It attacks your immune system. Um, it causes an imbalance in what's called the Th1, Th2 sides of the immune system. And I'm going to talk more about that after a little bit here. But that Th1 side, that's the side of your immune system that fights things inside your cells. The Th2 fights things outside your cells. And they actually have other jobs too. Uh, but again, we're going to get to more of that. And then also Lyme can actually alter itself genetically to evade the immune system. Not only that, but it actually can create biofilms like other bacteria do where the immune system just can't see it, which is very interesting. And then also inflammation or uh, Lyme causes a lot of inflammation, a lot of destruction in the body. It's like creating a fire in the house. It releases toxins into the body. Um, if, it dies off. It actually, uh, you'll still have the lipopolysaccharides in your body and those can create all kinds of trouble. A lipopolysaccharide or LPS, these are used in research. Basically, if you want to make an animal sick, let's say they're experimenting on a, on a mouse, they will inject it with lipopolysaccharides and the lipopolysaccharides cause a, a major immune inflammatory response in, in these mice. And then they can run experiments on, Hey, how do we get down this inflammation? extremely inflammatory. And then of course it stimulates these mast cells, the immune system cytokines. Uh, again, it really has major effects on the immune system and inflammation. I thought this is kind of a little funny uh, thing to add in here. All right. So back to some symptoms here. These are some more general symptoms, weight gain or loss, uh, extreme fatigue, swollen glands, uh, fevers, uh, regular, you know, more infections than usual, uh, symptoms that kind of come and go or wax and wane. Migrating pain is very common with this. And then initially a lot of people have flu-like symptoms. Um, and then unexplained skin rashes that come and go or move around. And then uh, just this recurrent general headache. So those are pretty general. Here we go with a bigger list. And I'm, you can read through this a little later. Uh, but definitely such a wide range of symptoms. And you could diagnose so many different conditions with these types of symptoms if you're looking at symptoms alone. So many possibilities here. So it is for many doctors, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, we diagnose this, 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 and this. The patient's not getting better. We're trying this, this, and this. Patient's not getting better. Uh, maybe we should test for Lyme disease. So it, it is, it's a diagnosis of exclusion a lot of times, unless you're looking at this a little differently. So again, these different diagnoses, and I kind of went through some of these chronic fatigue syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, all these autoimmune issues. This can generate food allergies. Um, uh, even Parkinson's and Alzheimer's could be mimicked by Lyme because it likes to affect the brain and the nervous system. Depression, anxiety. I see a lot of my patients who have Lyme tend to have anxiety issues. It's because their fight or flight system is on all the time. Cognitive issues, brain fog, memory loss, headaches, migraines, cough. I see that in insomnia. So what about this testing? What do you do here? So basically this would be more of the CDC's recommended testing, basically enzyme immunoassay or immunofluorescence assay. So when they run these tests, it's either positive or negative. If it's negative, they'll say, hey, look at something else. If it's positive, then they wanna know, hey, did the symptoms occur less than 30 days ago or over 30 days ago? Because that's the types of antibodies you're gonna look at. And again, these are the called the Western blot test that uh, you may have heard of if you know some about Lyme. And again, uh, you know, how well does that detect things? Not very. Some things show that it's less than 30 percent. All right. Here's the problem with this type of testing, too, because you get bit by the tick, you start to get some symptoms. And then you call your doctor and you say, oh, I need to make an appointment because I've got this, this, and this. Finally, you get in to see your doctor. So we've got time passing since you've been bit. The doctor says, okay, you know what? Let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Um, and then you've got your doctor. He says, okay, we're going to run some tests. 
So then you leave the doctor's office, you get your lab requisition, you finally go to the lab, you get your blood drawn. Again, by the time you return to the doctor, go over the lab test results, you've already went from acute Lyme to almost chronic Lyme potentially. So this bacteria has had all this time to grow and um, make more of itself. So it's, it's, just, it's just kind of a bad situation. So there are other types of Lyme testing, and these aren't usually talked about in conventional medicine. In fact, a lot of conventional med medical doctors don't even know about these. Now, a lot of your ILADS doctors do, um, and a lot of your alternative doctors do, because they've had to look for other ways to figure out these mysteries for these patients who have such chronic health issues. And I mentioned at the top ones we talked about, IFA, um, ELISA, similar testing there. Also, there's one called C6 peptide. And some doctors say, hey, I just have to use questionnaires because these tests are so unreliable, we got to use a questionnaire. Um, then there's the Western blot. That's the one that, of course, recommended more by the CDC. And then there's blood PCR. And we've heard a lot of PCR information here lately. This genetic testing. And uh, with that, there's different labs that do that genetic testing. Also, um, there is T cell testing. And again, you can look at these immune system cells and here's some labs that relate to that. Also, there's culturing where you can take some uh, uh, potential Lyme that's in tissue or in blood and culture it and hopefully it grows in the Petri dish. And then, hey, is that what we have? Urine antigen testing. Um, again, it's a urine test where you're looking for this and urine PCR, you're looking for genetics in the uh, urine there. And then the Felix Phage test um, the kind of focal, it's laser microscopy, immune testing. Now, when we get to immune testing, all those others are to try to look especially for Lyme or Borrelia in the system in just many different ways because it's, there's just not one test that seems to do it. And some of these companies have been around for a while. Some of them are newer, some of them are really good at this. Um, but still, again, it can be limited on test result. Immune testing. Now, this is where your doctor would go otherwise. They would also not only look at those things uh, above, but when you get to immune testing, they've got to run some other labs. These would be what are called complement testing, which is C4 and C3A, uh, which is part of the immune system, CD57, your natural killer cells, um, TGF beta, TNF alpha. These are immune system cytokines, interleukin-6 and immune system cytokine. So you're looking, hey, is there immune system activity? Is the immune, the immune system fighting something chronically? Is this pointing us in a certain direction? HLA genes, these would be, again, some genetics you're looking at. Uh, and then um, ANA, anti-nuclear antibodies, you're looking on the autoimmune side. Uh, a complete meta metabolic panel, that's what a CMP is. Uh, doctors should be running those anyway to look at uh, a lot of variables in your system. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate or ESR, another inflammation marker. CRP or C-reactive protein, another inflammation marker. They should be looking at your white blood cell counts. Now, this can vary. I've seen many of my patients, though, with Lyme have low white blood cell counts. And when I say low, functionally low, below a five. If your white blood cell counts below a five, functionally, that's a problem. That's a compromised immune system. VEGF, this is going to be related to inflammation in blood vessels. Uh, homocysteine, this is another inflammation marker. Glyc A, another inflammation marker. Immunoglobulins, this is to look at, uh, hey, how's your immune system doing? Because if your immunoglobulins are already low, they can run these cytokine tests and they'll be negative because again, you can't even, your immune system can't even make enough uh, cytokines to, or immunoglobulins to show a positive test. So there's a lot of variables here, a lot of gray areas, um, very tough to use labs to diagnose Lyme. And again, if you do show a positive or a pretty high positive, it means it's pretty darn bad. Though also it usually means your immune system is halfway decent because it can show up on the test. All right, so these are samples of some of those different uh, labs that I just put on here. And again, these are just kind of interesting to look at on, hey, what do they actually, where do, where do those results come back looking like? So the next thing we want to talk about is co-infections. And, you know, there's a lot of theories out there on which co-infections occur with which types of ticks or which co-infections are more common. And I'll kind of give you a little more of my experience. I would say Bartonella and Babesia are probably the most common that I see. Um, 
And both of these can create a lot of trouble in the body where Bartonella is more in that bacterial family, Babesia actually is in the parasitic family. But these are probably the common buddies of Lyme that travel with it. Now also we'll tend to see anaplasma show up or lichia. Both of these bad guys can create a lot of trouble uh, anywhere in the system too. They're oftentimes called multi-organ symptoms. That means they can affect multiple organs in the body. Not a good thing with those. Um, and again, if you read on the internet, if you Google some of these things, they tend to give you worst case scenarios. You know, the thing is, is we still have an immune system. It still is going to be keeping some of this at bay. So usually we're not going to get those worst case scenarios or probably you're already in the hospital. Also, we're going to see Rocky Mounted Spotted uh, Fever, very common. Um, probably I don't see that as commonly. Uh, mycoplasma, though, we do see pretty commonly. Uh, and you don't even have to have Lyme to get mycoplasma. Uh, and then these viruses. So the viruses commonly occur with Lyme, but this isn't as much a co-infection that usually comes in at the same time. Here's what happens is the Lyme comes in, and like I was saying, it's so it suppresses your immune system and attacks your immune system, which compromises it. And that opens the door to these viruses. When we see Epstein-Barr virus, when we see cytomegalovirus, these are signs of a compromised immune, an immune system. Ad an adult immune system should easily be able to zap these viruses. And you know, you'll often hear like Epstein-Barr, which is also called mono or mononucleosis. You'll hear about that with chronic fatigue, you know, and maybe you'll hear about it. Hey, uh, the teenager is tired all the time and he's got the mono. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's probably the most common scenario. And what does the doctor say? Go home, sleep it off, and then see how you do. So again, there's really no answers for these viruses in conventional medicine, as we've seen. But again, uh, these have to be dealt with because I feel there are answers for those. And uh, But these are just common. The, these all are in the herpes family, this EBV, CMV, and HHV6, uh, which is herpes herpetiform virus 6, and then Coxsackie virus 2. And then there's others here that we probably don't see as often, but definitely can occur. And I've seen some of them before. Q fever, toxoplasmosis, tularemia, brucellosis. And again, there's many more. It's like you, you bring down the wall, you bring down your defenses. It opens the door to all kinds of potential bad guys. So how would we find these co-infections? Because we've got these other tests to look for Lyme, but now we've got to do more testing to look for the co-infections. And there's really no good ways for this. Um, but there are some where, again, they'll look for the antibodies to these or even use the PCR uh, DNA testing. And there's some labs that do that. Even your more conventional labs like LabCorp and Quest will do some of those tests. Now, how good are they compared to some of the more specialized labs? Hard to say. Um, also with Babesia, some doctors say, hey, you could have an elevated ECP, and then, um, which is an eosinophil um, issue there. And then elevated VEGF and ACE, sometimes they'll say, hey, that could occur with Bartonella. Sometimes they'll say, hey, your uh, white blood, I mean, your platelet count is low. This often happens with uh, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, and Babesia. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and then if your white blood cell counts low, they're relating that to, uh, to all of those bad guys. Again, possibly. Uh, it, 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 just because you have low white, low white blood cell count wouldn't always mean this, but it's, it's again possible. Anemias, they'll relate to a Babesia and Rocky Mountain spotted tick fever. And then hemoglobinuria, that means, hey, I've got a hemoglobin in my urine. They think Babesia. Um, and then if your liver enzymes are abnormal, liver inflammation, usually they'll relate to these. And then if you're low in sodium, yeah, Rocky Mountain spotted, fi fi spotted tick fever is an option there. And then elevated bilirubin, um, same thing there. So these are all possible things that may relate to these. I don't really know completely where they get all these. These are just some things that have been put out there especially with ILADS and um, alternative medicine. So let's say you've had all these tests run. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Maybe they're all negative, maybe they're all positive. What do you do next? What do you do to deal with this? So first of all, you got to figure out what phase are you in? So phase one is called the acute phase. That's just after you got bit by the tick, probably like uh, half a week to four weeks out. 
And this is again, when you still probably have that rash, um, again, there's some symptoms here, like, hey, I've got some flu-like symptoms, I've got a headache, lightheadedness, fainting, muscle pain, stiff neck. I mean, there can be so many other symptoms too, but this would be this initial phase. I think four weeks out is really too long for this phase. I think people quickly go into this uh, subacute phase, especially if they already have a lowered immune system. And this is where we can even get more symptoms. Yeah, do we have the rash? Yeah, maybe, and it's thought of, hey, maybe it's smaller at this point. Is my brain getting inflamed at this point? My meninges of my brain? Um, this is thought that this could be in this phase. Uh, and also, am I starting to get neurological symptoms, not only from neuropathies, but also like Bell's palsy, uh, which is a facial nerve palsy. It's where the side of my face starts to droop. and. Um, Again, that's a that's cranial nerve seven there. And then also, am I starting to get some heart uh, symptoms there uh, or signs of heart inflammation? And then again, am I starting to get migrating joint pain? This is where all this can slowly begin in this subacute phase. And then if it goes on long enough, that's when they'll call it late phase or chronic. And that's when, hey, I've got all these symptoms. I've been feeling lousy for a while. I've had all these potentially different diagnoses or they caught it early and uh, we know what it is, just can't get rid of it. And then of course, this can cause changes in memory, mood, um, emotions, um, autoimmune conditions can start to increase. Um, and just all the above symptoms can really run, run rampant. I would say the thing is, is with Lyme, it tends to really um, go into and affect the, um, uh, the brain in particular. Um, and nervous system, that's one area it and its co-infections like to affect joints, muscles, tendons, ligaments, um, big factor, and then also um, uh, the skin. These are kind of the th three big areas where a lot of this will tend to um, uh, really occur. All right. So what does conventional medicine uh, kind of uh, feel about this? Well, number one, they'll say, hey, you know, if Lyme exists, it's really just in the acute phase. Use some antibiotics, get rid of it. You're good to go. Some doctors say, hey, no, I've got patients who, um, you know, they're past the acute phase. They're still having symptoms. They're still feeling lousy. Uh, they got bit by those ticks. And those doctors are looked down upon because they're trying to treat patients who have chronic Lyme. And chronic Lyme in conventional medicine isn't really a um, looked at as an existing uh, possibility. Uh, so it's it's definitely frowned upon, and these doctors are going outside the box, and um, it's it's not always a good thing for their career. All right. So also in, in medicine, in conventional medicine, what you're going to see is they're going to give you some medications, uh, probably two to four different things depending on what's going on, and uh, these can be used anywhere from you know three months all the way to 24 months. So if it is intracellular, if the Lyme is in your cells, which it often is, especially if it's um, uh, in the phase two or phase three, then here's your list of antibiotics for that. If it's outside the cell, which if you've gotten bit and you have Lyme, it's always going to be outside the cell too. Again, here's some antibiotics for that. And then if it's in its cystic form, if it's in the form where uh, it's harder for the immune system to find or deal with, uh, or has changed its form, then these are some different things that hopefully can help with that. Now, the other problem is, is when you give a person all these different antibiotics, especially if you're giving them intravenously, then you really mess up your body's good bacteria because you're killing not only the bad guys, but you're killing a lot of good guys. And these aren't just targeting Lyme, they're targeting all kinds of things. So then suddenly uh, fungus starts to grow because the good bacteria are down, then you can start to get candida growth. So then they say, okay, take an antifungal, fungal, anti, excuse me, antifungal. And then um, also if you have been diagnosed with Babesia, they may use an anti-malarial. So the only problem is, is if you are taking some of these things, you need to be cautious and don't mix alternatives with this too much because if you take any herbs or botanicals, these could easily interact with these drugs and create worse problems. Also know on these particular drugs that if you do have this, your doctor should be regularly performing EKGs because they can damage the heart. 
All right. And then um, a few other things here on the co-infection. So we talked about what are these treatments for Lyme? What are the conventional medical treatments for co-infections? Well, anaplasma reliquia, these are the probably common one you'll hear about with Lyme is doxycycline uh, used. Bartonella, there's some different antibiotics. Babesia, there's some different antibiotics. If you have a virus like Epstein-Barr or cytomegalovirus or some other virus, they'll use these drugs like acyclovir, um, famcyclovir, um, alinea. So the thing, which is alinea is also an antiparasitic, but the thing is, is viruses, um, these drugs don't kill the viruses. What these drugs do is they decrease or inhibit DNA and RNA replication, which is supposed to slow the reproduction of the virus. These drugs are also only meant to be used short term because can you think long term, slowing down DNA, DNA and RNA replication through your entire body? And then uh, mycoplasma, more um, uh, antibiotics, uh, also Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And then if you do get these candida issues, these yeast issues, here's your different uh, antifungals, which the problem with those is those are extremely toxic to the liver. Here's the other problem. Research paper, I only listed a few on here, a few research papers. If you start to go in and Google Scholar these, um, you're going to find more research papers than you could ever read on the ineffectiveness of antibiotics for Lyme and the dangers of antibiotics for Lyme. You know, it is just so abundant because when you give these antibiotics for Lyme, number one, Lyme is a gram negative bacteria, so it's very antibiotic resistant. Number two, you start hitting it with antibiotics, it's going to adapt and soon you're going to create super bacteria like you do with other uh, bacteria that we've seen over and over get more antibiotic resistant and now no antibiotics work for it or even some of the very strongest. So then you're just creating a worse problem for yourself. So number one, they rarely help. Number two, allow Lyme to mutate into these more resistant forms. And then of course, there's the damaging side effects of antibiotics. So how does alternative medicine handle this? Where, what is, what's their story? So they're talking more about herbs and botanicals, classical homeopathy, ozone, um, ultraviolet therapies, um, all kinds of different supplements, Rife Machine. Now, Rife Machine is kind of interesting. Um, Rife Machine basically is based on frequencies. And, and uh, the Rife Machine uses what's called a Tesla tube, puts out light at a certain frequency. And one thing we know, see, the thing is, is drugs, medications, even a lot of supplements are based on chemistry, the chemistry in the body. Whereas the different way of looking at things is from a physics standpoint. Actually, physics controls chemistry, but a lot of doctors aren't into physics or really don't get a lot about physics. So the thing is, is, is basically in physics, all matter is energy. Einstein said that. And the thing is, is if, if all matter is energy, it also has a frequency. It's like you, you turn your radio into a certain frequency. Well, what Rife is doing is, is putting out a frequency and what you can do is change the frequency to match the frequency or the potential frequency of Lyme. And then the hope is, is that you hit that Lyme with the frequency and that kills it. And actually there is, I mean, you can look at Lyme under a microscope, use a frequency and you can watch that um, uh, bacteria die off. I, I don't think they've done it with Lyme, but they've done it with other bacteria in experiments. So, the thing is, is Rife is on the right track. They're thinking in the right direction, but it's still too generic because their frequencies uh, are based on ranges um, that they're just putting out all the time. And it's saying, hey, everybody with Lyme, either this one frequency or sometimes they'll span it over different frequencies where it'll kind of alternate. And they're hoping that it falls in into that. There's problems with that that I'll talk about in a minute because frequencies are very per person and Lyme doesn't always exist at the same frequency, at least from what we see from a bioresonance testing standpoint. All right. So also with alternative care, uh, we've got these natural antibiotics, you could call them, uh, which can be just as effective. So we've got 
the ones I listed here, cat's call, Japanese knotwood, all of these are what we would call natural antibiotics. Now we also have some non-herbal antibiotics because you do have to watch out with herbs and botanicals because again, if they push your immune system the wrong way, yeah, that could create more trouble. Also, these are also going to kill good bacteria too. Um, kind of interesting there. And then we have uh, non-herbal antibiotics like colloidal silver, because silver is a charged particle, it kills bacteria. Um, Oxypure, which is um, three molecules of oxygen joined together. It's usually in a liquid form and you just take it. It's also a good natural antibiotic. And then ozone. Um, and ozone again is a gas. Um, you can put it in oils and use it, or you can get the gas into yourself via IV um, or different methods of getting it into your sit or injection. So, I also looked at these different protocols. Many of these doctors have um, done research, uh, maybe even, well, really have written books um, about how to deal with Lyme from their standpoint. Uh, Cowden, he's basically using these two different uh, herbs that are just elements of that cat's claw, which is an herb. And uh, he's saying, hey, this is what I found uh, potentially effective. And then Buner, who's an herbalist, um, basically using these particular herbs. Uh, Cowden, Chang, Winston, um, these are all medical doctors. Uh, Chang, again, uh, different things here that he uses. And then Winston made his own compound called Spiralid, which is a combination of all these things. And, you know, uh, these are, they're, they're trying to find a way from a chemistry standpoint, hey, how can we kill this? We, how could we use a natural antibiotic to hopefully kill this Lyme uh, issue there? Which I still feel, even with these methods, um, I really, uh, and, and reading some of the, these books, um, haven't seen a lot of effectiveness. All right. And, and don't take that as a negative because they do have effectiveness in some cases. Um, I guess I see a lot of people who tried a lot of these things and it's not working or it's just giving them temporary symptom relief and then their symptoms are coming back. And then classical homeopathy. So uh, home, homeopathy, again, more based on frequencies. Classical homeopathy uh, is more based on we're using different herbs and botanicals to make homeopathic remedies. And these herbs and botanicals have similarities to Lyme or other things. So uh, these, because uh, Lyme is a spirochete, syphilis was a spirochete. So they're using syphilinum, which is a classical homeopathic remedy uh, from syphilis. Uh, Ledum from, uh, which is actually a lead. Um, it's not, you're not taking lead. It's actually a homeopathic remedy. Um, and then hypericum, uh, nosodes and isodes, that's where we're, they're using the actual Lyme or co-infections to make the remedy, but at these classical homeopathic strengths, um, which we'll talk more about that because I don't feel that that's effective from a classical side. And then uh, these drainage remedies, these are different remedies to stimulate like lymphatic drainage, liver drainage, system, systemic drainage, um, which if you're treating from this standpoint, can be helpful. And then a company called Desiree Biologicals who actually makes a Lyme kit where basically they're, they're using these nosodes or isodes as I call them and uh, they're changing the strength. So you start at a certain strength, you move to a different strength, different strength, you kind of go up and you go down and you go through the whole kit and hopefully that will make a difference. I think they're on the right track. It's just they're not able to uh, get to the strength. It's again, very generic. All right, so here's the thing. For all these people who have chronic Lyme, who are not getting results, who are going from doctor to doctor, who are um, maybe getting some symptom relief, but still feeling lousy all the time, um, what do you do? Because uh, you've tried conventional medicine probably, you've tried alternative methods, it's just not working for you. So I have to look at this a little differently. And I talked about this more in the very beginning in kind of my definition of what's really occurring here. So the thing is, is when you have Lyme disease, very rarely do you just have Lyme disease. You usually have other things. So here's, here's a kind of an example here. Let's say a husband and wife are walking in the woods and um, the husband gets bit by a tick, the wife gets bit by a tick. In fact, they're walking home they're looking at their ankles and they've got both of them have two ticks on them so basically day or two goes by or maybe even immediately 
uh, one of them, let's say the wife gets a rash. Um, the husband does not. The wife starts to feel horrible and starts to become symptomatic. The husband does not. The husband feels fine. He says, I don't know what's going on with you, but I feel great. Uh, the ticks didn't bother me. I got a little rash, but it didn't bother me. What's the difference? What's the difference between those two people? except their husband and wife, one's man, one's woman. And it could be the other roles could be reversed. It could have been the husband that got uh, symptomatic. The thing is though, the difference is, is we've got to look at their immune system. What was going on with their immune system? Because let's say Lyme and co-infections entered both of their systems when the ticks bit them. But one of them, their immune system was not compromised and their immune system dealt with the Lyme and the co-infections and no big deal. The other person, the Lyme, the immune system was unable to combat the Lyme and the Lyme basically started to make a home. So what affects the immune system? What can compromise the immune system? Also, when we see people with low white blood cell counts, what's going on? Low immunoglobulins, what's going on? Why are their immune systems not working well? Well, number one, toxic agents, chemicals, heavy metals. These are things we're surrounded with almost every day and throughout our life. In fact, heavy metals can cross the placenta. So we're born with a lot of toxins already in our body. Now, here's the interesting side. If genetically you're a good detoxifier, you just dump this stuff. There's some people out there treat their bodies horrible day in and day out, eat horrible, drink horrible, smoke bad stuff. I mean, it's just, the thing is, is their body genetically can just dump this stuff and they can, their immune system can tolerate it. People with chronic health issues, autoimmune conditions, not good detoxifiers. This stuff gets stuck in the system. Now, if it's a chemical or a metal, your immune system can attack it, but it can't kill it. It's just going to keep attacking day in and day out. So again, here's our difference. So we've got to look at what's compromising the immune system. And again, heavy metals and chemicals can be a big one. And they're rarely talked about because there's no good test for them. You can't find them. They don't float in the bloodstream. They get inside your cells and doctors are not going to biopsy every cell in your body and use an electron microscope to look for these things. It's impossible and you wouldn't make it through the test. All right. So there are other ways to look for these things. Also infectious agents. Usually there's other infectious agents already in the system and these could be other bacteria, other viruses, other, I mean, you could have had Epstein-Barr virus before you got Lyme and it just didn't get found to the test. Um, parasites, funguses, all kinds of bad guys that can be in your system. Uh, ruinous lifestyle, we talked about that. Yeah, if you treat your body badly, if you eat bad things, drink bad things, and do bad things all the time like that, yeah, it degrades your health and your immune system's ability to fight battles. Uh, let's say you had a surgery, and ever since that surgery, you've had some problems. Yeah, these can be, or you got a vaccine, or you got some type of um, you know, other drug that you took that gave you a negative effect. These are things that have compromised your immune system and then you got bit by a tick and hey, it says, hey, immune system's down. We can really uh, live here. And then malfunctions. So we can have malfunctions even from birth. We can have birth uh, defects. We can have issues, genetic issues we're born with. Although genes are a tendency, they don't have to be your destiny. There's usually something triggering those genes that's affecting their ability to make enzymes. Another one is EMFs. And this is rarely talked about EMFs basically radiation, electromagnetic frequencies. These come off of cell phones, computers, all these towers you see all over the place, smart meters. I mean, uh, time and time again, we'll see these as problems with people. And it's just not talked about when people say, hey, every time I, you know, um, get exposed to, uh, you know, that smart meter that's at the head of my bed, I wake up with a headache. Before that, I wasn't having any problems. You know, I'm at the computer all day and I come home and I feel lousy. And then when I'm on the weekends, I'm away from the computer and I feel much better. So again, uh, there's these EMFs. And then also there's trauma. You know, many people have had physical trauma or stress in their life, emotional trauma or stress in your life. These are things that inherently also lower immune system. So if the immune system is being lowered by these things and you're not a good detoxifier, possibly, which is usually on the genetic side, then again, Lyme can have a heyday. So this is the way we have to look at this. We don't just want to look at it. Hey, I got bit by a tick. I got Lyme and there's the story. 
All right. So, and like we said also, then once Lyme gets in, it starts to invade your immune system. It starts to attack your immune system anyway, so it further compromises it, which is not good. And then that opens the door to more bad stuff to happen. And it's not just infections, it's all those other things I talked about too as potentials. All right. And then we've got your uh, conventional medical testing, which is unable to determine or find these issues. A lot of these issues that I just showed you do not show up on conventional testing. Um, it just doesn't. And so if, it, if, if you're not bleeding, if you don't have a broken arm, if you don't have a tumor, a lot of times doctors will say, oh, you're fine. What are you, what are you complaining about? You look fine. Why are you complaining? Just uh, go eat right and exercise and you'll get better. You know, it's very frustrating what some of these patients go through and all the tests that they have run. And then when everything shows negative, you know, they get treated like they're crazy. And uh, most time, most times when people continue to complain to their doctor, then they're put on anti-anxiety medication or antidepressants because now it's all in their head. So we've got to look at this difference. Now I talked different. We I, I talked earlier about the Th1 and Th2 sides of the immune system and how that fits in and how you have to test certain things that relate to that. Now here's this here's the interesting side of this is we need this teeter totter to be level. If it's unlevel, that's a problem. These are two very important sides of your immune system. The Th1 side is like your SWAT team that goes out and helps kill bad guys that are floating around in your bloodstream and uh, uh, or even inside, I'm sorry, more inside your cell. And um, again, but this Th1 side also can trigger other cells that can get things in the bloodstream too. And the SWAT team is just kind of a all or nothing. It kind of dashes in there, attack, 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 kill, 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 inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. The problem is, is it doesn't really do a good job of finding the bad guy. So if it can't find the bad guy, then you can get inflammation that gets out of control. The cause doesn't get dealt with. So then the TH2 side comes in and says, hey guys, calm it down. They are anti-inflammatory. They kind of help put out the fire, kind of squash that TH1 side, kind of tell the SWAT team, hey guys, go take a break. We got to pull in the private investigators and really look for these bad guys, see if we can find them. Then if we find them, we're going to tag them with antibodies. Antibodies are like post-it notes. You, you put these little post-it notes on what you think are the bad guys, and then the immune system can come along later, the Th1 side, and say, hey, there's a post-it note. That's a bad guy. Attack it. So then it helps us to find those with those uh, antibodies, with those cytokines. So that TH2 side, TH1 side are very important that we do have balance. Here's the problem that I see with many patients. This is imbalanced and they start to take certain supplements. And I listed some of those supplements. There's a lot more things that can affect this, but they'll start to take these supplements. And sometimes we'll see that patients um, are TH1 dominant. The teeter-totter's gone the other way where the TH1 is, is side is high. And then they start to take these natural herbal antibiotics. Well, you just tilted the teeter-totter completely further in the wrong direction. And now you just, it, it's like you just poured gas on a fire. You really increased your inflammation. You made yourself worse just because that herb or botanical online said, hey, this one works good for Lyme. You took it and now you made yourself worse. Or you did the opposite thing. You, you, stim you overstimulated the TH2 side. We have to determine which side needs stimulated, which side does not, so we can safely deal with your condition without making you worse. And, and sometimes when people try the herbal side and it makes them worse, they'll say, oh, alternative medicine didn't work for this. You know, and so again, it's because they did it to themselves or a doctor did it to them, a doctor that didn't look at this type of thing and said, hey, everybody with Lyme, uh, my patients that have Lyme, I give them all this. That's my protocol. That's my recipe. We do not want recipes for Lyme. We don't want to treat the Lyme, the diagnosis. We want to treat the person who has the Lyme. That's, that's the key. All right. The other side that's so important that we look at is this genetic side. If we don't look at the genetics, yeah, this can be a, a pretty important factor here because, again, everybody has some genetic SNPs, we call them, SNPs or single, single nu nucleotide um, polymorphisms. It means, hey, my gene's got a little issue here and it can malfunction easier than my other genes. Um, so the thing is, is these are a tendency. It doesn't mean you have to have the problem, but there are things that 
cause these genes to have problems. The biggest one is inflammation, deficiencies. Um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, physical, emotional trauma or, or stress. I mean, so many factors. If you remember that picture of bad guys where it showed toxins and infectious agents and all those things that I showed, all of those things can cause these genes to have problems and not create the enzymes that they're supposed to. And there's genes in here that help to regulate inflammation. There's genes in here that help you to methylate. Everybody's heard or majority of people have heard like the MTHFR gene. Yeah, that's one gene in the whole puzzle. Puzzle, genes do not work by themselves. They work together. So someone can say, oh, you've got an MTHFR issue. No wonder that's your problem. No, that could be a gene that's malfunctioning. And yeah, maybe you need some methylated folate, but these genes are kind of in order the way that I have them here. And if you start dealing with MTHFR and you have an INOS and a, a CAT issue, um, catecholamine transferase issue, yeah, you're not really helping your problem. You need to address some of these other genes first because the MTHFR is only going to be a very tiny puzzle piece in the whole puzzle. Also, there's a lot of these genes that help with energy production. There's these genes that help you metabolize um, uh, toxic chemicals, drugs, things like that. There are genes here that um, help your immune system. There are genes here that help you detoxify. There are genes here that help you to stay young. There are genes here that help to regulate blood sugar. Um, genes here for thyroid issues. You know, there's, there's many genes. And then even earlier, we talked about the HLA genes, and these relate to like allergies and um, your ability to deal with bacteria, especially over in the right column, HLA, DQ, A1, and B1. Those are related to bacteria and biotoxins. So very important that we look at these and we can look at these from a different perspective to more of a functional perspective and then provide things to cofactors things to help these genes more, work more efficiently so you heal better and faster and your body's able to handle things better. Okay, so really what is our plan of action? Um, because, you know, we've looked at the conventional method. We've looked at the alternative method. I've had to kind of look at all this and say, wait a second, these weren't working for my patients. What are some other options here? The biggest one, not classical homeopathy, but is called causative homeopathy. And this is where we actually do what's called bioresonance testing, we look and find, hey, what is the frequency of Lyme in you? What strength of a homeopathic remedy do we need for you? Not for everybody in the United States, just for you. For your case, we can make those specific remedies and deal with Lyme specifically. It's like a custom made, um, it is a custom made uh, homeopathic remedy for you. And um, that's why I love this. I'm amazed on how well it works. Uh, homeopathy, it is totally different. It's not something we're used to because, again, it's based on physics, not based on chemistry. And um, that's because the chemistry side doesn't work for this type of a problem. The homeopathy, uh, this type of homeopathy works amazingly well from my perspective and what I've seen clinically. Also, we will. We'll use some nutritional supplements. We'll use um, some of these things to help support those genes, to help decrease some of your symptoms, to help decrease inflammation, many things that we can use to help the body uh, because you can't get these things really from your diet. You can't eat enough to get the, you know, soils are depleted. You aren't going to get enough certain minerals and things like that from trying to eat good, especially if you have a health issue. If you have a chronic health issue, if you have Lyme disease, if you have an autoimmune condition, you have to have some support. You can't just fix it with diet alone, though, although we do look at the diet. We look at, hey, what are you eating? You know, what are you drinking? What's going into your body? Are you pouring gas on the fire by uh, eating pro-inflammatory foods, drinking pro-inflammatory drinks? So we have to maybe modify the diet and support you. And then also, many of my Lyme patients, they need some help. They need some tools for their stress, for their lifestyle, to help to change some of that. They need some coaching. You know, every professional sports player needs a coach. They have to have a coach. And again, when we are dealing with chronic health issues, coaching is important because we have habits, we have stresses, we have things in our life. And I find that the coaching really helps to push things along. Some people maybe need it, some people don't. Um, functional neurological rehabilitation. If we see certain things persist, I'm also a chiropractic neurologist, a functional neurologist. So we can develop 
um, different exercises, different protocols to stimulate certain areas of the brain. And it's just like a muscle. You're strengthening these areas that have been weakened, that have been inflamed uh, so they can start to function better. I, I love this functional neurology side. Um, then, of course, we talked about the genetic testing. And then, of course, we have to monitor things. We've got to look at, hey, um, yeah, you know, where are you at right now when we start? What's your baseline of your blood test or your other tests or on your bioresonance test? What, what, all, what all bad guys do you have in your body? And then we can make sure you're progressing because you can come and say, you know, Dr. Pakel, I'm feeling so much better. This is great. I have to see your test change. I've got to see changes occur on your blood. I've got to see changes occur on the other tests. Uh, not that we have to run every test in the world, but the markers that were off, we want to recheck, make sure you're progressing. And then if we know you're progressing, then we can, yeah, not only reassure ourselves that, hey, this is getting better, but also it helps us to track, hey, how much further do we need to go or what do we need or what can we still support? So we have to look at what I call these puzzle pieces. So there's more to this than what I've put on here. Um, and there are some parts here that, that maybe you don't know about or you haven't heard about. But these are things that we really um, have to look at with our, um, our Lyme patients. So I would say, um, you know, getting to the root cause of the problem this is the wise choice. You've got to get to the root cause. A lot of times doctors are treating symptoms. You know, if you get a headache, take this. If your gut is inflamed or you're having diarrhea, do this. You know, I mean, you can you can have a supplement or a drug for every symptom that you have, but getting to the cause is the key. Dealing with these actual heavy metals, infectious agents, chemicals, fungal issues, parasites, finding if you have those and if you do have them, get rid of them, uh, especially the Lyme. And then, you know, I see so many people that are getting shuffled from doctor to doctor to doctor, and they're really being treated like they're crazy, I, I hate to say. And, um, you know, it's almost like they're, they're telling you, you really don't know what you're talking about. Um, and uh, that's very frustrating because if you go to, if you keep, if you keep allowing that, you're kind of going on a road to nowhere. And, you know, if you keep going down that road, yeah, that could be the difference of you enjoying the rest of your life or um, sitting on the sidelines watching everyone else uh, do the things that you wish you could do. All right. Well, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed this presentation and uh, got some good uh, information out of it. And uh, God bless and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.